now that we know that we can always project down onto a closed subspace of a Hilbert space, we're going to show two corollaries of that fact that um, will be very helpful in the coming lectures. So let's have E, let's have H a Hilbert space. And let's have e a subspace of that Hilbert space, which is not the whole space. And we're going to prove two things. So the first thing is that we're going to prove that there's always, you can always find a u in h, uh, but not in e, that has norm 1 and such that the distance between u and e is exactly 1, right? So you can always find um, vectors on the unit sphere that are far enough away from any subspace that is not the whole space. And the second thing we're going to prove is that H splits into the orthogonal sum of E and E perp, where E perp is the set of all those vectors H that are orthogonal to anything in E. Okay, so I want to prove these two uh, important facts. So let's let's do one first. How do I construct that U? Well, I just pick any V that is in H, but not in E, and I define U to be V minus its projection onto E, and then normalize that, so divide by the norm. So I know that I'm not dividing by zero because V cannot be equal to its projection if it's not in E. And I want to show that this U does the job. So obviously it has norm one. I've normalized it exactly to do that. Um, and if I look at the distance between U and E, well, it is the length of the vector U minus its projection onto E and then I'm going to use the fact that PE is a linear map and replace U by its value. So I can factor out the one minus um, one divided by norm of lengths of V minus PEV. And then this is multiplied by V minus PEV minus PE of V minus PEV. And this is using linearity uh, but then using linearity again I get 1 divided by this quantity times V minus PEV minus PEV plus PE of PEV okay but PE of PEV well PEV is already in E so PE of PEV is just PE of V. So I get minus 2 PEV plus 1 PEV, that's 1 PEV. And so this is just 1. Okay, that proves 1. So this is sometimes called Ries lemma. Uh, this is very simple in this context. You can always find a point on the unit sphere at a distance 1 of any non-trivial closed subspace. I should have precised that this is closed here. Uh, we needed that in the proof of the existence of the projection, of course, because we, we used um, a Cauchy sequence argument and took a limit, and we needed to know that the limit was in E, and closeness is critical for that. Okay, let's prove two. So I want to prove that H splits as E plus E perp. So uh, I'm going to have to show that there always exists a decomposition of any vector in H as an element of E plus an element of E perp. And uh, to have uniqueness of that decomposition, I need to show that the intersection of E and E perp is trivial. It's only the zero vector. Uh, and that's easy to show because E intersected E perp is the set of all H in E that are also in E perp. So they also such that H V is zero for all V in E. But in particular, you can take v to be h and so this is included in the set of all those h which have norm zero and that is just a zero vector so the intersection is trivial and that guarantees that's a little exercise you should do uniqueness of any decomposition of a vector in h into a vector in e and a vector in e perp 
but now let's show that this decomposition exists so to do that given h in h i can write h as its projection onto e plus itself minus its projection right and this is obviously in e and so what we need to show is that h minus pe of h belongs to e perp so to do this um, let's take a v in e and let's give ourselves an epsilon worth of room uh, it's going to allow for a perturbation argument and sending epsilon to zero so i'm going to expand h minus peh uh, plus a little something or minus epsilon times v minus p of h right so let's perturb a little bit the ideal um, realization of the distance between h and and e expand that we get h minus p e h squared plus epsilon squared v minus p e h uh, and the cross term is minus 2 epsilon in a product h minus p e h with v minus p e h now interestingly enough i can say that h minus p e h squared is smaller than this quantity and that is just because um, this here is a vector in e right because e is a a subspace so because this quantity here realizes the distance between h and e this has to be a greater quantity okay but now in this inequality i can simplify on both sides uh, this quantity and i get that zero is less or equal to epsilon squared v minus p e h squared uh, minus two epsilon h minus p e h in a product with v minus p e h and then i can reorganize this inequality and simplify and divide by epsilon on both sides and that gives me that the inner product of h minus p e h with v minus p e h is smaller than epsilon over 2 times this norm v minus p e h squared and now i can send epsilon to zero so this tells me that h minus p e h inner product with v minus p e h is uh, less or equal to zero for every v in e but then i can choose the moment of e that is of the form of some generic element uh, omega plus p e h so this tells me that h minus p e h uh, w is less or equal than zero for every w in e okay but uh if i do that because e is a subspace i also get that h minus p e h in a product with minus w is negative for every w in e and so if you combine the two things let's actually combine them straight away here um, then what do I get I get that the inner product of H minus P E H with a generic element W has to be zero because has to be both less or equal than zero and greater or equal than zero and that is exactly saying that H minus P H is in E perp concluding the proof okay we now come to the conclusion of this second chapter and uh, prove our key minimization uh, result in Hilbert spaces and that's the theorem due to Stempaka 1963 it's very similar to the lax milligram theorem it's a generalization of it where instead of working on the whole space we're going to be working on a closed non-empty convex subset obviously convexity as we've seen play a key role as it often does in optimization question so we have a coercive continuous bilinear form 
exactly like in the lax milligram theorem and we're going to show a very similar conclusion that whenever you have a linear form you can find a unique solution in your convex set k to this optimization problem this is no an inequality over the convex subset as opposed to being an equality as we did have in the lax milligram theorem so let me just show you the lax milligram theorem again so continuous coercive bilinear form no convex set we're just working on the whole space and we're finding in h a unique solution to an equality like that so the bilinear form being equal to the action of a linear functional and here it's not an equality it's an inequality of the relationship between this bilinear form and this linear functional so um, I'll show you in a second that this is a little more general and just like the second part of the lax milligram theorem uh, in the special case where a is symmetric we get a very neat variational characterization as this solution u to our problem being the minimizer of a certain uh, quadratic function now let me just show you that this is indeed a generalization of the lax milligram theorem so let's make a remark here um, if k is h what do we get so we get that a u v minus u is greater than phi v minus u and we get that for every v in h and we have our u in h and right? so there exists a unique u in h so this implies that a u w is greater than phi of w for every w in h right and because every w can be written as um v minus u, uh, in the form v minus u for v equal w plus u obviously and uh, not only this is true but because this is true for every vector omega uh, of every vector w sorry we also can multiply this vector by any real number and the inequality will stay true so this is similar to what we've seen in the proof of the corollary a minute ago once you have inequalities like that of an entire subspace and you can multiply by minus one then you also get the inequality in the other direction so you get that a u omega is greater than phi omega i keep switching between omega and uh, and w um because i've write in the same way it seems so i get that and i get the same thing with a minus sign and then by linearity of phi and by linearity of a i can multiply all of that by minus one and get the opposite inequality and therefore that gives me that a u w is equal to phi omega for every omega in h so this means here that stompakia theorem really implies lax milgram theorem okay so we're going to prove this theorem of stempakia and this going to imply the lax milgram theorem and let me remind you one more time that once we have lax milgram theorem we also get this neat corollary here that uh, the pd minus laplace u plus lambda u equal f as a weak solution for every f in l2 of omega um, put in a different way there is an inverse to the linear map minus laplacian plus lambda times the identity that's a direct consequence of all of these theorems so we've brought this question this is really a variational approach to pd we've brought down this pd question to a question that is linear algebraic slash variational in uh, nature and then we've reframe that in an even more general context of minimization in Hilbert spaces and we're going to prove this uh, much more general theorem about convex optimization in Hilbert spaces that's going to have this very neat chain of implications so let's have a look at the proof now so what do we need to do we need to find 
a u in k such that a of u v minus u is greater than phi of v minus u for every v in k. Okay, so let's try to turn this question that involves a bilinear form a and a linear functional phi into a question about inner product. Now that's what the risk representation theorem is going to help with. So by risk representation theorem, what have we got? So we have that for every v, so well we have that there exists a unique, let's call it f in h, such that for every v in k, but even for every v in h, phi of v is the inner product of f with v. That's because phi is only linear functional, that's literally what the Reese representation theorem gives us. It represents this linear function as an inner product. Now, on the other hand, um, given a u in h, whatever that u may be, we can find also a element of h, let's call it a of u, that represents the linear map v goes to a of u v, because a is bilinear, so we can find an element a u in h such that a of u comma v is the inner product of a of u with v. Right? That's another application of the Riesz representation theorem uh, that's for v in h. So really our question is to find a u in k such that uh, for every v in k, let's rewrite our uh, inequality, we have the inner product of a u with v minus u being greater than the inner product of f with v minus u, and um, that is equivalent to saying that for every v in k, uh, a u minus f in a product with v minus u is non-negative. Now I could even multiply that by a positive number, it would not change anything, so this is really equivalent to saying that for every, uh, let's call that rho, for every v, uh, we have that rho times a u minus rho times f, I should write it like that, rho times f, uh, inner product with v minus u is non-negative. So this gives us a bit more flexibility in choosing that row. Now this uh, here is very reminiscent of the uh, description of the projection onto the convex set u. Uh, indeed, I could rewrite that, adding and subtracting u, and say that for every row and for every v, I'm asking for rho a of u minus e plus u minus rho times f minus u in a product with v minus u to be positive, to be non-negative. Uh, and that would be saying that that would be saying what? Uh, that would be saying that for every row, uh, u happens to be the projection onto k of rho of f, rho times f minus rho times a u minus u. So what we need to do is find a u in k that satisfies this fixed point equation. And we have freedom in doing that because we can choose rho exactly as we place. So we're going to define a family of linear map as rho from h to h that sends u to the projection onto k of rho f minus rho a u minus u. And what we want is to find a u in h such that s rho of u is equal to u. So we want to solve a 
fixed point equation. And that u in h will automatically be in k because it will be the projection onto k of something. So this would solve our problem. So what we've done really is that we've reduced a family of inequalities here to a question about a fixed point of a bounded linear map. And really the advantage of the row is that if you remember your fixed point theorem, you need to prove that S row is a strict contraction and we're gonna have some freedom to pick row small enough to guarantee that. So to show that S row is a strict contraction, I'm first gonna prove that PK, the projection onto a convex set is always Lipschitz continuous. So that's my claim here is that PK of U minus PK of V, the norm of that is always gonna be smaller than the norm of UV for any U, V in H. So how do we see that, um, this Lipschitz continuity of the projection onto a convex subset, we just um, remember that U minus PK U, in a product with V minus PKU has to be less or equal than zero for every V in K. And in the same way, V minus PKV in a product with U minus PKV has to be non-positive for every V in K. I should not call that V, of course. Uh, that's for every W in K, and that's for every W in K here. Uh, and then I'm going to pick my W so that I get uh, on the first line U minus PK U PK V, which is definitely an element of K minus PK U is less or equal than zero, and V minus PK V PK U minus PK V is less or equal than zero. Now, let's put that in the, the right order. Uh, U minus PKU in a product with PKV minus PKU is less or equal than zero. I'm trying to get this quantity here, which is what, I'm, what I wanna control in my claim. Uh, and here, let's multiply both by uh, minus one, and I get PKV minus V and here I get PKV minus PKU. Now I can add the two things and adding them gives PKV minus PKU plus U minus V in a product with PKV minus PKU has to be smaller or equal than zero. And this is saying that the norm squared of PKV minus PKU has to be smaller than V minus U in a product with PKV minus PKU. And then you can use cauchy schwarz and obtain that PKV minus PKU, the norm of that squared is smaller than the norm of V minus U times the norms of PKV minus PKU. And now you divide by this quantity on both sides, unless it's zero, but if it's zero, the uh, claim is trivial anyway. Okay, so now we wanna use this fact to prove that the map S rho, which is defined by S rho of U equal the projection onto K of rho F minus rho of A U plus U is a strict contraction if we choose rho in an appropriate manner. So let's give ourselves a U and a V in H and let's start computing the norm of S rho U minus S rho of V, and it's gonna be simpler to look at that squared. Now this is the projection onto K of something, and we know that the projection is Lipschitz continuous, so this is going to be smaller than the norm of rho of A of U minus V, using the linearity of capital A, uh, minus U minus V, and all of that is squared. So I'm going to expand that norm, which is given by a inner product, and I'm going to get that this is equal to rho square A of U minus V, norm of that squared, plus norm of U minus V squared minus two rho 
a of u minus v in a product with u minus v. Now let's rewrite all of that uh, in terms of the form. So this is rho squared, the bilinear form, little a, times the supremum over all the w in h that have norm 1 of a of u minus v comma w squared plus the norm of u minus v squared minus 2 rho of a little a of u minus v comma u minus v. So on this part here I can use the coercivity of the form and on this part there I can use the continuity of the form. And what I'm getting is that this is smaller than c squared rho squared times norm of u minus v squared plus norm of u minus v squared minus 2 rho delta norm of u minus v squared. So this is really uh, 1 plus c squared rho squared minus 2 rho delta times norm of u minus v squared. And so the question is, can I find rho such that 1 plus c squared rho squared minus 2 rho delta uh, is smaller than 1. That is c squared rho squared smaller than 2 rho delta, which holds whenever rho is smaller than 2 delta of a c squared. So there exists such a rho that makes s rho a strict contraction, and therefore, by the Banach fixed point theorem, we have that there exists a unique u in H such that s rho of u is equal to u for any choice of rho that small. So to finish, the last thing we have to show is the variational characterization when A is symmetric. And really the idea here is that if I have an A, a bilinear form that is symmetric, continuous and coercive, it really is just another inner product. So let's see that. So we have that for all u and v in H, delta norm of u squared is smaller than a of u u, uh, and that's smaller than c times u squared. Right, that's by continuity and coercivity. So a of u u is a quantity that is equivalent up to some constant, fixed constant, to the norm of u squared. So I'm going to define, uh, well this was really just for all u in h, but now for all u and v in h, I want to define um, the inner product of u and v adapted to a as being a of u v. Now this is bilinear and uh, quadratic uh, form associated with that is equivalent to the norm of the Hilbert space that I started with. So exercise, you can check that the that h with this inner product, this new inner product is a Hilbert space and so its norm with its norm that I'm going to denote by uh, norm adapted to A, which is the inner product of whatever it is by itself. If you square it, uh, equivalent to the original norm. Right, so I have a new Hilbert space with a new, some more deformed inner product, which has been modified by A. So my inner product between U and V is no a of u v here. Nevertheless, I have a Hilbert space with respect to this new inner product, so I have race representation theorem. And this representation theorem tells me that for every e phi in the dual of h, there exists a unique g in h, such that for all v in h, phi of v is given by the inner product against G, but the inner product being now the inner product adapted to A. I'm using race representation theorem in the Hilbert space H with respect to this inner product. And well, by definition, 
this is a of g comma v. And you can see, you'll see that by doing the exercise, of course, that the, the fact that a is symmetric is important in proving that this is indeed a uh, inner product. Okay, so now that I've rewritten phi of v as an a of g v, um, my condition that is that for every v in k, uh, a of u comma v minus u is greater or equal to phi of v minus u. This takes a neat form uh, in terms of the a inner product, right? This tells me that the a inner product of u is v minus u has to be greater or equal to the a inner product of g with v minus u. And that is really saying that for every v in k, what, what is it? g minus u inner product with v minus u a inner product is less or equal than zero. Now, this is exactly a characterization like what we have in our very first theorem of this chapter, theorem 2.1 that tells us that u is going to be the projection of g onto k but in the Hilbert space which that has the norm adapted to a and uh, what is that telling me well it's telling me that g minus u minimizes the distance between a v uh, a generic v in k and the point g but that's with respect to the a norm and well, let's square that and rewrite that in terms of our bilinear form, in terms of what, sorry, this is the A norm too, in terms of what the A norm is. So what have we got here? We've got that A of G minus U, G minus U has to be the infimum of A of V minus G, V minus G over all V in K. And then we can expand this and we get A of G, G, plus a of u u minus the cross term and we use uh, symmetry here equal to the infimum of a of g g plus a of v v minus 2 a of v g also using the symmetry now we have a of g g on both sides this has nothing to do with what we're taking the infimum over we can take it out of both sides and we can divide by two and so we get one half of a of u u minus a of g comma u equal to the infimum of a one half of a of v v minus uh, a of v g with over all v in k which is exactly the variational characterization that we were promised and this one half that you know might have looked a little strange at first and the first uh, expression we had for um, the lax milgram theorem for instance uh, it's natural it really is coming from the fact that we have a two popping up when we uh, expand the square norms and, and we look at the cross terms and that concludes the proof of stampakia's theorem and therefore concludes the proof of lax milgram theorem and therefore concludes the the proof of the existence of solution to uh, PDs of the form minus Laplacian U plus some positive number lambda U uh, equal to F for an F in, in L2.